Jesus, I love you. I love you so very, very much. How often, let me ask you a question, how often do you tell him that during the day? That's why your life is not like it should be. Are you satisfied with where you are or even where you were at one time? Don't you want to be like the Apostle Paul or like Moses or like King David? Some people just, ah, I'm just satisfied where I am. How can you ever be satisfied? Don't you have an image? Isn't there some image in your mind or some desire? Well, at least a thought, is it possible for me to be like David or, or Abraham or Isaiah or one of the apostles in my commitment to Jesus Christ? You might not ever be an apostle. Well, that's not the point. That's just the outwardness of their life. What about their commitment to God, though? How often do you say, thank you so much for everything that you do for me? People, people enjoy, and God's no different, people enjoy gratitude being expressed. And God deserves it more than any of us, and he appreciates it more than any of us. Gratitude being expressed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for all that you've done for me, for the love that you have for me for the family, for the wife, for the husband that you've given me, for the church that I have, for a, a written Bible that I can read in my language, in my tongue, for all the things that you do. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for experiencing the excruciating pain of Calvary to release me, to loose me from the debt of my sin and the slavery and bondage of my sin. You really thank him for those things all the time. If we don't, you see, that means we just take those things for granted. I can guarantee you, if you change your life and you start doing these things, your life will change. And I think you know as well as you're sitting there and as well as I'm standing here that what I'm saying is true. When you express your life and your devotion and your love to God like that, your life just blossoms in you all of a sudden are the pleasant person, the most pleasant one to be around because you have something to offer. You're different than other people. You have, you have some, something to offer that other people don't have. Another basic area is the study of the scriptures. You can never be too busy to read your Bible, to read your Bible. You can never be too busy to read your Bible. But you say, well, here's my problem. And all the teachings that our pastor is giving us, it makes the Bible just so complicated and it's so detailed and there are so many things to know about it that I finally just stopped reading the Bible because how could I ever really know what's being said since it takes so much skill and expertise to interpret it? Well, we're back to this, we're back to this conflicting notion of, of two sides of the same coin, both being true. The reformers came teaching in contrary to R.C. doctrine, the doctrine of perspicuity of scripture, which in short means that the Bible is written in such a way that any and every average common Christian man can read it with great blessing, with great benefit, and with great understanding. Now the RCs taught differently that you have to have a special interpreter come, the priest, and he would tell you what the Bible meant. And don't read the Bible on your own because if you do, you'll get confused. And so wait for the special interpreter to come and interpret the scriptures and read the scriptures to and for you and then you will know what that means. Well, the reformers came teaching that's bondage to, to, to liturgical hierarchy. That's, that's, that's bondage to men, to have to have some man come and interpret the scriptures and read the scriptures for you. And yet these men, these reformers, the reformers that I have reference to were theologians themselves. And they were greatly concerned about the misapplication and misunderstanding that the common man had about certain things in the Bible. That's why they spent all their time writing. That's why Luther wrote 55 volumes on his commentaries and Calvin uh, 20 what 22 and Calvin wrote his institutes and and Luther wrote bondage of the will and table talk and his book on Galatians and his book on Romans and Calvin wrote his commentary on the book of Ephesians and all of these other things why would they have written that if they thought well everyone knows everything that's not the point everyone knows everything it's perspicuity it's every average common Christian man or woman 
can read the Bible, whether it's Genesis, Isaiah, whether it's Malachi, Matthew, whether it's Romans or Revelation, can read it to great benefit, to, to a great end of blessing, of encouragement, of learning, and of understanding. It will always be the case that special skill and special training is needed to get really into the deep things as well as the technical things. The spiritual things as such, your relationship to God, you don't need any man to teach you those things. You don't need anyone to tell you where to find that in the Bible. Just pick up any book and start reading. All of a sudden you see God is God, you are man, and you're to devote your life to him. It takes no Hebrew, no Greek, no theology, no nothing except your Christian experience to pick the Bible up. Get into Hosea. Get into Amos. Now, we read Amos here. Now, well, let's just go back to that. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Amos chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. Now, what actually is Amos talking about uh, whenever he says, for instance, we might even have to find another, uh, another chapter. Let's, let's find something. Well, let's, let's go to chapter uh, 4 and verse 4. Or no, let's go to verse 1. <laughs> let's just start in chapter 1. No, let's start in chapter 4 and verse 1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan. All right, now, what's a kind of Bashan? So you just kind of skip over that. You must can still, the way the scriptures are written, you can still get meaning, and I mean a lot of meaning, a lot of Christian meaning out of them, without worrying about what the kind of Bashan. You see, they happen to know in, in the day of Amos, and you see, that's where the cultural sense comes in. We're removed, therefore we need someone to come and tell us what the kind were and where was this place called Bashan and why would Amos, you see, you have to know that to, if you want to get the, the full meaning out of what he's saying, why does he refer to the Israelites as kind of Bashan? You see, if you want to know deeply what he's talking about here, you would have to know what the kind of Bashan were to know why he's going to call an Israelite that. So what, you don't know that? Well, let's go on anyway. That are in the mountain of Samaria. Well, let's say you don't know where Samaria is, all right? So you just say that um, you're in the green mountains of Vermont then. Which oppress the poor. Okay, now we're into something. Now, you, you kind of know what that's about. Oppressing the poor. That doesn't take any knowledge of Bashan or Kine or Samaria. Which crush the needy. Which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Uh-oh, see, I just get things out of just that phrase there. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, lo, the day shall come upon you that he will take you away with hooks. All right, let's say you've never seen relief inscriptions in, in Assyria monuments, monuments from Assyria. So you don't know about Assyrian hooks. Well, you know about fish hooks. <laughs> See, those of us who are more trained, that, that sometimes bothers us. But, but we have to, you have to be, I was reading an article recently. Well, it was more, it was longer ago than recently, but I thought of it recently. Even that was longer ago than recently. So I'll just go back to what I was saying. I read an article <laughs> one day where, and it was an excellent explanation where the pastor has, the, the theologian has to be a, a pastor and the pastor has to be a theologian at the same time. The theologian has things and sees things and comprehends things like the pastor doesn't. But the pastor can be effective in areas where the theologian can't be effective. Therefore, you really have to have and have to be able to be both of them. If you can't be a, a pastoral theologian, then be a theological pastor. You're going to have an emphasis, one or the other. It was really talking about evangelists. I'm substituting pastor in right now. Be an evangelical theologian or a theological evangelist. You see, it depends on what emphasis you are taking there. I thought that was, that was beautiful. So my point was theologians, people who study, don't like people to think of, you know, a number two fish hook whenever you see hooks here. If you know anything about fishing, a number two or number three hook. You don't want them to think number two hook. But... You, you, you would say this to yourself, if that's all you can think of, lay Christian out there, you've never studied the inscriptions of Assyria, if that's all you can think of, that's better than nothing at all. At least you know what a hook is. It looks like a fish hook. Now, you don't know how this applies to Israel. You, if you don't know anything about Amos, you don't know when the book's written. They're going to go some, some type of captivity. Maybe you don't know whose captivity. You don't know anything about Assyria. You don't know about them taking prisoners of war away with hooks. So, anyway, you don't understand that. 
and your posterity with fish hooks. Well, there'd be our problem. You'd have fish hooks and fish hooks together instead of hooks and fish hooks. But anyway, you at least would have something out of the passage. You shall go out at the breaches, every cow at that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Well, you might not get too much out of that verse, uh, but you would still read and you're still just looking. What's the message here? Come to Bethel and transgress. Well, you didn't think God would invite people to sin, so you might skip over that. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. And you got to kind of, you had to know more about the Old Testament that they had established profane places of worship at Bethel and Gilgal. And so this is a, a uh, sarcastic taunt to them. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes after three years. Well, that must be the three-year tithe of, of the Old Testament. That's that unusual tithe. You wouldn't really know much about that. So you'd say, bring your three years tithes. Uh, okay, money. I'm somehow supposed to bring money to the church. I guess I get that out of that. Well, that's what, that's what you would be expected to get. You wouldn't know how to apply that back to the Old Testament law, but you'd still get a meaning out of it, though. See, I think some of you have just been discouraged from reading the Bible because you hear all of what I have to say. And wow, I didn't know you had to know about money changers and the tax collectors and Pontius Pilate and Herod and who was married to whom, and it's just overwhelming to you. But all of that's going to be necessary to give you a deeper meaning of the passage. But I'm not saying you can't get something out of it, though. Read it and study it and meditate upon the scriptures to get the spiritual import out of them. But if you're a true Christian and you know this is God's holy word from heaven, you'll never be satisfied just with that. You will want to know everything that's possible to know about this book. You'll want to know everything that's possible. And knowing everything about this book is not possible. So notice what I said. You will want to know everything that for you is possible to know about this book. See, I hope you can read Amos without knowing anything about who he was, why he's writing, where he's writing, to whom he's writing, what it's about. But you get all of these meanings as you go over the book. Now, if you've heard me make negative comments about that form of theology and reading before, that's because I've got semi-negative beliefs about that, but that comes from my expertise side. My other side, the pastoral side, says, but you can't just close the Bible, though, just because you don't know all the technicalities here. You just can't close up God's Word. You pick out a psalm, and you read it, and you read it for and to yourself. Wait, that wasn't to or for or about you. Well, you can still get something out of it. I can tell you you'll get more out of it. You'll get what you got plus more if we'll do a study of it then you'll know more about it there. So the negative comments that I have made, I will probably continue to make. And anyone that's trained in a certain area, you kind of look down your nose somewhat at people who aren't trained in that area and who just misapply everything and just and they kind of muddy the water then because they're not doing like they should be doing. But in this, in this Christian church spiritual sense, there's always going to be another side to me and there's always another side of the issue. Some people are kind of pastoral theologians. It's just pastor for them all the time and just, well get good, good, good meanings out of it well yeah I know some deeper things here but there's no sense in sharing those with you people because it's more than you can handle we'll just stay with the pastoral side then there's those there are those who are theological pastors pastors theologians theologians pastors who put the emphasis first of all in the area of we have to know these things we have to know these things but let's don't say we have to know these things to the expense of not getting anything at all out of it because there is so much to know and there is so much to learn. I trust you understand. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings for this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. You see, some of that you might not get a lot out of. The last verse of chapter 3. What's the winter house and the summer house and the ivory house? What's the difference between a summer and a winter house in ancient Israel? And what's the difference between those and an ivory house, a house made of ivory? Well, I find it to be very interesting, the difference between a winter and a summer house. Mm -hmm. But even if you don't know that, uh, God's just saying, I'll smite all your dwelling places. You could paraphrase it like that. I'll smite the winter house, the summer house. I'll smite your home. I'll smite your lake, uh, your lakeside cottage. I'll, I'll, smite, I'll smite your second home up in the mountains of Colorado. You know, you could put in contemporary terms there for what he's saying here. 
your winter house, your summer house, your houses of ivory. So we've got pray, we've got worship, we've got read the scriptures. And you just cannot get away from these. And the reason I'm mentioning these things so much right now is because of this plague. It's just a plague of, of busyness, of being too busy. Just a plague. It's right in Mark chapter 4, the cares of this world, the distractions of living on this globe, on this planet. Just soak up all of your energy. Distract all of your attention away from the more important things, which are the, the word of God and the spiritual aspects to our life. That's why I'm mentioning pray, worship, and study of the word, because of this plague of busyness, that you have to discipline yourselves to be in this and to love to do it anyway. Another thing is your attendance here at church. That's Hebrews 10 and verse 25. Hebrews 10, 25. You see, we don't have the liberty to, to contradict, regardless of what you think liberty is. Liberty is never to contradict or to go against what God's word clearly teaches. Hebrews 10, we could start with verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That is spiritually dangerous to do. You lose out on the fellowship, the worship, and most importantly, just the teaching of God's word not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. It was current then, evidently. But exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, and then he goes into that discourse that we've read earlier. You see, we can't compromise biblical truth. Liberty never gives us the freedom to compromise biblical truth. Biblical truth is biblical truth. When he says, I've established my assembly and I've put leaders over my assembly and they are the house of God made up of lively stones, God's called out ones, God's sanctuary, God's temple, God's tabernacle, then that is exactly what we are to do. That is exactly what we are to experience. I had just sensed in some people's minds because of the teachings, things that have been said, that we, that we just thought that things have become more relative now relative to time, relative to circumstances, relative to our whims, and they're not. We are bound forever to the holy standards of the Word of God. We are bound in our Christian life forever to the teachings of the apostles in the New Testament. They followed with one accord the apostles' doctrine. We are bound forever to that. And, we, and when you start violating that, it's going to wound your conscience and it violates the precepts of God's word, and it will lead to other things then. One thing will always lead to other things. I've said in the recent message also, I think, some, some purposes of coming to church. First of all, to learn about God's word. Another purpose in coming here is the tremendously important purpose of remembrance. I just has really been impressed strongly on me by the Lord how important this aspect, this function of our gathering together is. You can't just you can't just quit church, just stop church. You will lose so much in your spiritual life because you lose that thing that causes you to remember spiritual matters again. You went along Tuesday and Wednesday and all of a sudden it's Wednesday night again. And think, if you don't have church then, you'll probably just work right through the night and be busy again then. And you lose that, that, what, that thing that is supposed to exist there to remind you of spiritual matters. Don't you know what I'm talking about, how you just get caught up with things during the week and church brings you back to spiritual topics and reality again? And the more often you have church, the more often your mind is just caught up into the things of God, the things of God, the things of God just the way that it is. Besides, in addition to learning the word of God, as far as you know, our, our roles are concerned, apart from learning the word of God, 
just the aspect of being a reminder to us has to be one of the most important things in the church. You have to ask yourselves the question, why did Jesus ever establish the church? Why not just make all of us individual Christians and let us get together whenever we want to? Why establish the church? What's the reason? What's the purpose behind that? Well, we've got the, 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 um, the ordinances to participate in as a body together. We have the teaching of the word to participate in as a body together. We have our worship of God to participate in as a body together. But then what about why? Why church? Why get together? Why have this? Why they meet as they met in the first century? To remind ourselves, to keep ourselves called up into God. We know from experience what happens when you stop church, when you get away from church. You just go and go and go and you get so dry spiritually because you're not here reminded of the things of God. And let me make another comment. Even if we're on some topic different than what we're on this morning, you're supposed to use the whole experience of being here, fellowship with one another, the worship service, testimonies. You're supposed to use all of that as your reminder then. You might not get teaching like you're getting right now. So what? We'll get it all said and done sooner or later. You just can't do it all at the same time, though. And, and I've never been one, and I never have, and I never shall back away from my philosophy of teaching in the church. It doesn't matter how much reaction or resistance I get, I'll never back away from that. Because I can guarantee you this. If I back away from that and give you this type of message every time we're here, that will not satisfy you like you think that it might. Amen. Oh, if we could just have that all the time, that would not satisfy you. Because you'd be reading the Bible one day, you'd come across all these confusing verses and passages, and you'd ask me about them, and I'd say, I don't know anything about them. I, I can't study that. I've just got to get these simple messages ready all the time. And you'd try to find out what it means. You don't know what it means. It would never satisfy you like some of you think that it would if we just had these easy, quote, easy, end of quote, services and teachings all the time. I would just float all the time. No, you wouldn't either. You, you, would, you would become so dissatisfied in just a short period of time. And I think even more so now that you know what's out there, what you already have under your belt, and what you know, that, that the things that you know that exist out there in the future, so dissatisfied, I'm getting cut short in this area somehow. See, that's what I felt like the whole time under faith assembly. I enjoyed the simple teachings that kept my mind on God, that reminded me to pray, that reminded me to worship. I enjoyed all of that. But the whole time, and, and, I, and I benefited from that, the whole time I felt like I'm getting short changed, though. There's more in the Bible. I want to know more about the prophets and the kings. I want to know more about the kingship and the, and the institution of prophetism in the Old Testament. I want to know more about the Levitical sacrifices. I want to know more about the chronology of Paul's life and his travels. I don't want to just read all of that just for the selfish reasoning, reason of trying to get myself blessed or encouraged that day. That can be part of it, but I want to know more of what's there. I'm going to get short changed in the long run. I want a deep study of God. I want a deep study of psychology. What is the mind of man? What makes personality from one person differ? from another. I want to know things like that. Never got any of that. And you know what happened, you see? And I'm, I'm telling you from my own experience. And not that I ever wanted that. I wanted the other thing all along. But you will grow very, very dissatisfied. Pretty soon you just come to church. You kind of know what the topic is going to be. Faith, healing, persecution. And you take all of that for granted. You see, if you heard that all the time, oh, we're back on praying again. Well, I heard that last week. Oh, we're back on this again. We're rarely back on this again around here. Mm -hmm. It's we move, snap, snap, snap of our fingers from one topic to another to cover all this because there's so much still to cover in the future. Impossible to remember all that. That's not why we teach it. You already know that. Why worry about that? Why fight and struggle with that? It increases, it broadens your horizon of biblical knowledge. For some of us, we have to remember more of it than some others. If you're not required to remember so much of it, still use it to broaden your concept. The last thing that we taught in the intertestamental period, which we were supposed to be on this morning, evidently we'll be back on Wednesday night to that. Well, the last thing we learned, and we didn't get to the verses yet that are very interesting, about the money changers. All of a sudden, add a whole new horizon to that aspect of the gospel accounts of him driving those people out of the temple, they were money changers. What was a money changer? 
Oh, there was the Greek and the Roman coin, the drachma, the denarius. You might not remember all these terms, but you'll remember some of this, though. The rabbis established this law that that was profane money. Bad inscriptions, bad image on the coin, and maybe other things as well. Probably the most important thing is if we can specify a certain type of coin to be used, we'll charge interest on the changing of the money, and we'll grow opulent through that. That's exactly what they do. So you have to have the Tyrian silver coins, and we'll charge you 12% interest on that. See, I happen to remember all that. Maybe you don't remember the facts, but you still remember what a money changer is now. And you grew up in Sunday school, the money changers, the money changers. He whipped them with a whip or a belt and kicked in the rear of the cows and knocked the doves over and threw the tables upside down. And, and so, but why did he do all of that? Something else behind it. Well, anyway, my point is you have to come to church to learn things like that. You're going to have to be here to learn things like that. And you surrender church and you'll surrender that. Faith. We will try to wrap up faith. <clears throat> and I might put faith hyphen worry not because they go together but they are the opposites of one another if you have faith it's what keeps you from worry we need to remember that there are one or two passages in the Bible which say if ye ask anything in my name I will do it Now, some people took all of that as a formula, okay? When you have a need, say, I claim this according to this verse in Jesus' name, amen. That's not what he said. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. What do you want done? He said, if you ask anything in my name, in my authority. Oh, now you know a little more that you don't have to end your prayer in Jesus' name. That doesn't make you any more righteous than someone else, though, just because you know that. Because maybe that will make you not pray then. So you ended up worse than people at Faith Assembly. At least they are claiming and believing the promises down there. And so now you believe there aren't any promises anymore. Just kind of just kind of live and just everything will kind of be okay. That's not what the scriptures say. Jesus said, hitherto you've asked nothing. Now ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. What do you want? Work it out yourself? I'd recommend praying about it. We're back to prayer then. Trust God for it. God will do something for you. He will do something for you. And what that will keep you from is worry. And the final topic, and I think I'm going to stop because that's probably more than you can handle this morning to remember all of these details here. And that, that concerns the area of selfishness. And I'm just going to come to again. And I mentioned it in some virtues as we've gone through them, but maybe you haven't stopped to apply all of it. A lot of the problems, it seemed like, that, that took place in the church around here were, were initially brought about. I can't say this was the cause because it's not a valid cause. Maybe the misconception in someone's mind. But were brought about because I desired to move somewhere and go to school. Oh, everyone just ends up in a tizzy then. And I've heard it from some of you. What are we going to do? How are we going to make it? Brother Ross, going to school, I don't know if we can afford to do that. Oh, and then what am I going to do in my life now? That is so selfish. Man alive. I've been here so many years giving myself to all of you people here, working as hard as I can, selflessness being expressed. Why should you end up selfish all of a sudden? Well, that's not fair. If he's going to leave and he's going to go do this, and what about me? That is so selfish. That's been really disappointing to me. Really disappointing. Very, very disappointing to not think that, that I have a group of people here that I have spent so much time and so much labor with and on and not have a 1,010% backing of them but have all of this worry and all of these doubts and all of these questions and these statements made to other people that I find out about because some of the good people in the church come and tell me, well, did you know what someone said? that They're really having a problem with you going to school and they just don't know about this, that, or the other. I think how, how backstabbing is what I think. How backstabbing, how abusive to use someone else for your own good. And then when you, when you suspect, and, and your suspicions aren't even valid anyway, when you suspect that 
all of a sudden you're going to get nothing out of this anymore then you're just going to call it in the end right now well you've been getting years out of it already that's just so selfish just to be thinking about yourself and I'm being very plain with you but that's just the way I have to be around here to be so concerned about yourself your own family your own future I must not have been too concerned about that or I never would have left Mississippi dear friends I wanted to go out and be a blessing and help other people if I was just concerned about my own family my own future my own well-being I would have stayed in a much more secure position than Excelsior or Waconia Minnesota Excelsior was not secure when I first moved there. It was not secure at all. I went through it anyway. And look, I got a lot of good out of that. Out of not being so self-centered, I got a lot of good out of that. I think the same thing would work for you if some of you would change your attitude a little. You're, you're worrying too much. You just worry. He's going to be there how many years? Okay, now... Now, how much money does that cost now? Now, we're going to have to finance that. L let me express it a different way. I don't look at it as someone financing like I'm getting something above what my paycheck is. I ought to get to use my income however I want to use my income. One thing that's so strange about being in a position like this, and you'll never know it until you're here, it's different whenever you get a check from an impersonal corporation for the work that you did there. It's just different. They don't, they don't, there's something different then when you are laboring among a group of people and you get paid directly from them, they think somehow that that money they gave is their money. And if it was a corporation, well, you know, you know, it's just, it's your money and you feel free to spend it. But whenever it's such a close relationship like what we have right here, then somehow it's, it's well, he's doing that with what we gave him. No, he's doing that with what he earned. Amen. The same way you earn your money, I earn my money. I'm doing that with what I earn. I think that's really, it's really, it's really low to look at it. If some of you are looking at it that way, it's really not fair to me at all. And wherever you end up, if you don't last with these teachings around this church, I hope you'll treat other people better than that, not think like that, or just try to be a pastor for a while and see the difficult relationship you have. Amen. I'd rather get a check in the mail. It's what I'd rather get at the end of every week. Just one check, I don't know who sent it, came from some corporation. It says IBM on the top of it. That's what I'd rather have. It's much easier to deal with that. Much easier to deal with that. People view what I do as not being work. That's what they view it as. You know, whenever you go and you work all day long, quote, work, and I mean with your hands, you know, then you get a check at the end of the week or the end of the year for some of you, but you get a check anyway. Okay, you worked. You worked, and what, and what everyone else thinks about you is you worked for that money. But Brother Ross, he just mostly sits at home. He just reads magazines all day. He just reads books all day. Well, that's where I get some of the information. That's where I get a lot of the information. He just, um, what does he do? He just does this, that, or the other. He doesn't really work. you got a, you got a very perverted misconception of what this whole calling and this whole role is, is all about. And I was telling Dale, we were talking about some of these things the other day at work, at another type of work, maybe to you, a more real type of work there. And I said, you know, I said, it's just remarkable what, what a pastor, I guess I was kind of complaining to him, telling him a few things here and there. I'll complain on anyone's shoulder who'll let me. You come over this afternoon, I'll complain to you. I've just been so disappointed. I said, you know, as a pastor... You're a marriage counselor, you're a psychologist, psychiatrist, sociologist, you're a family planner, you teach on birth control, you teach on marital relationships, you're a psychological counselor, you're a vocational counselor. You know, those guys make thousands of dollars for your visits to their offices. I don't get paid a cent for it. People come over to my house for counseling, they sit there an hour or two, and fine, I, I don't want you to put money whenever you leave. I'm just saying that's, that's part of my role, part of my calling, but hey, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of stress and pressure for everyone to come and say, I've got this problem, will you help me with it? The psychologist will say, yeah, that'll be a hundred bucks. I'll help you with your problem. I'll send you a bill for it too. <laughs> and hey, I'm not complaining about the psych. That's only fair for you to go heap all your problems on some psychologist. He deserves your money. You see, that's work for him. He's trained to help you get out of your problem. 
I don't get paid for any of that. He gets to go home. I go home and get called during the middle of the night. About the only other person is a fireman or a doctor who's on call 24 hours a day, and that's only for like two weeks, and then he takes a week off. You know, a fireman works two weeks and a week off. Pastor, it's all the time. It's all the time. It's all the time. Am I complaining? I'm not complaining about the job at all, the role at all. I thoroughly enjoy it. I complain about people's reaction to it. I complain about people's misconception of that. I complain about people's selfishness in areas like that. I don't mind my time being taken up. That's what I'm here for. If I didn't like to do that, I'd get out of the ministry then. But uh, you'd, you'd be surprised the, in, the increasing statistics, and they're coming out all the time, of, and I was expressing this to him the other day as well, I'm just reading it all the time, of what they call now in, 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 in Christianity, in American way, pastoral burnout, pastoral burnout. You get to the place, you're expected to be the model person. Who's expected to be the model person around? You say, I can't make any mistakes. I'm not supposed to. My wife is not supposed to. She is to be a pastor's wife. And all the wives, all the women model their life after her. My children are perfect. They've never done anything wrong. And all the children pattern themselves after them. And I don't ever do anything wrong. You see the role model, the pressure that you have to have. And pastors just get tired of that. Uh, you're expected to be 20 years old as a pastor and 75 at the same time. So you've got your youthfulness to you and your age. They want you to have curly and straight hair. <laughs> <laughs> they want you to be tall and short, fat and thin, a brown eye and a blue eye. They want you to love working with the old people but spend all of your hours with the youth. They do. That's what they expect. You have to somehow meet everything because there are so many different things there. And then to have people complain. I'm kind of admonishing and rebuking you and I'm kind of taking up defending my own calling and my own ministry and my own person here this morning. Because I've wanted to say this just in as, and I'm not saying it in as plain of terms as I can, but I'm saying it close enough to that to satisfy me this morning anyway. I just wish we had more, more backing behind what's going on here and not so many people worrying. Some of you women, because it comes back through other women to me. Yes, when I was with this other sister, they were just really concerned about how everything's going to work out and how their family is going to get taken care of if you go away to school, if it costs a lot for you to go away to school. How are they going to get taken care of then? My, my, you don't have any faith. Or you wouldn't be worrying about that. And above that, in my mind's eye, is a person is, so, is such a selfish individual to think like that. You would never make it as a pastor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, that's for sure. Because people want to dump everything on you. You'll ne never make it as the head of any company. You've got to control all the problems. Everything comes back to your desk. You'll never make it if you're a selfish person. The best place for you to be is way at the very bottom of the ladder where you don't have any concerns. But he said every 10 seconds, hit that button. That's what I'm going to do. You don't have any concern. Hit the button every 10 seconds. You know, on an assembly line, just push the button. You don't have any responsibilities except that one. No concerns. The machine breaks down. You call the mechanic to fix it. You don't have to fix it. The company closes down. No concern to you at all. You'll find you another job where you can push another button. You need to think about what you are as a person. You'll never handle something like that until you lose that selfish streak or trait in you, if you happen to have that here, and some of you do. Some of you don't, some of you do. Now, I think our whole life is, is, is supposed to be geared after Jesus Christ, Philippians 2, that we, we don't count these things dear to ourselves, but we empty ourselves, we surrender ourselves for the good of someone else. And by the way, that's the message of Christian love as well that we're on. It is self-sacrificial. It is self-sacrificial. Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for someone else? You don't have love then. You're missing God in that area, you'll miss God in other areas, and you'll never make it as a dominant, successful person in life. Not in the Christian sense if you're not willing to be a sacrificing type person. You think that it'll hurt you. It'll do you more spiritual good and blessing, <clears throat> more mental good than anything that you could ever, ever have done otherwise. You think it'll do you harm to sacrifice yourself for someone else? Hardly. You'll be so satisfied. You'll feel so good about yourself. 
when you sacrifice yourself for someone else. I look at my own self and I, I get satisfaction out of that. I get satisfaction out of the fact that I haven't left this church or something. I get satisfaction out of that. Amen. And if you're the type who can just sacrifice yourself and continue to go in a certain area for someone else's good, you're a good person. Hey, don't you remember there are going to be rewards in the kingdom of God once all of this is over and done with? There are going to be rewards. Some of you have forgotten rewards. Are you striving to be the best you can be? Rewards are dependent on how you live your life in this life. Oh, I'll sin a little bit here and just won't pray and, and just basically not be spiritual anymore. Then if you make it in at all, you'll make it in yet so as by fire and you certainly won't have rewards that will be taken away. People forget that, the whole subject of rewards. I think about that. I'm striving. You want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Then be a slave to your fellow man. Be a slave to your fellow man. You want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. You want to have rewards in the kingdom of heaven? And serve your brother and serve your God while you're here on this earth. Do your best. Live your life in the fullest Christian way possible. You'll get those rewards. That's not a... That's not wrong to think that way, or he never would have laid before us crowns and rubies of gold and glory. That he said, I promise to those who overcome in this life. Certain things are promised to those who overcome, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, who overcome in this life. You overcome these things, and I will grant these things unto you. You keep my word to the end, I'll grant to you the position and place of ruling over the nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 2 is just as valid as it was when faith assembly taught it and it has ever been and shall ever be. It's valid. And I think about that. I don't, I don't want to just waste my life living a natural carnal life here with my family, with my goals or my outlooks in life. Forget all about the fact that this life is temporary and that I'm going to lose all of those rewards I could have had otherwise.